one of the radical claims of the postmodern types, especially yes. people like Foucault, is that the fundamental motivating drive of humanity and perhaps the cosmos itself is power. Now, you know, I, I think everything Foucault thought about everything is to be taken with a gigantic grain of salt because, you know, <laughs> he was quite the awful creature. And I think he had every reason for putting forward the proposition that there's nothing other than power because that justified everything he did that was done purely on the basis of power. But, but, the, but there's, another, there's another problem that emerges with that proclamation, which is a kind of self-evident problem, and, and I would think this is something the rationalists have a very difficult time with, which is, if I can compel you to do something, why don't the next two propositions follow logically? First of all, if I can compel you, the mere fact that I can indicates precisely that I'm actually a better man than you, because if you were better than me, you could compel me. And of course, this is might makes right, but might makes right is a very powerful doctrine, and almost all the pre-Christian pagan societies operated on that basis in the most fundamental manner. And the aristocratic justification was something like, well, you're a peasant, and the cosmos has established that you're a peasant, and I'm an aristocrat, and so screw you. And and actually, morally speaking, because if you weren't a useless slug, you wouldn't be a peasant. And that's a very, very difficult argument to, to generate a counter-proposition to. And the corollary argument is, well, if I can force you, clearly I'm more powerful than you are, and that means that I have every moral right to do so. And in fact, you don't even get to object because you're too lowly to object. But that and that reflects, and that's the way of the world, man. Yeah, but it reflects a, a series of values that needs to be questioned. Where do these values come from? To argue that the cosmos made me an aristocrat and you uh, a serf is a very tenuous argument. And in the end, it seems to me that we've got to ask ourselves the fundamental question: What? basis have we for valuing human beings as unique? And again, I refer to your comment on Genesis. We're made in the image of God. That gives us huge dignity and value. It was something my parents got across to me when I was very young. And as a Christian, even at the bigger level, the, the idea that there's a higher value even than the created value, which is the whole topic of Exodus. And I was utterly fascinated by your conversations on, on Exodus because the valuation of people that is reflected in the Passover lamb and the sacrifice in that God accepts them on the basis of a sacrifice. And it seems to me that actually leads me, now that I think of it, and into, into another direction. One of the problems of establishing rules of any kind seems to me that many of them bypass the heart of Exodus. It's very noticeable that the law of the commandments comes after the Passover sacrifice, after the redemption. And in the New Testament, the parallel thing uh, for Christians is the sacrifice is first, the acceptance is settled. It's not on the basis of your moral behavior or life, but that empowers you to live so that the moral commandments in the letters of Paul, for example, come after the discussion of the sacrifice that gives you a true value. Now, that is something that is lacking at the heart of our, our culture. We have no answer, ultimately, to the big questions of guilt and the whole problem. Nobody likes the word sin, but th that's what it is, the, the moral damage we cause to ourselves and other people. And setting up rules and regulations is hugely important. We need them. They're in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. But I notice that one of the major messages of Exodus is first redemption. And redemption is by the blood of the Passover lamb, to put it in the biblical language, and then the teaching. 